Hello everyone. I welcome you all to the another revision session for NEET for chemistry. In this particular session, we are going to focus on the chapters that is P block elements, DNF block elements and coordination compounds. If you notice these are the chapters from your inorganic chemistry of your grade 12. So here I am going to deal with certain questions and through those questions we will be revising our certain concepts based on these chapters. So let us go ahead with the very first question here. So the question says here which of the following statements is wrong. So we have to basically identify the incorrect statement of the following options which are given to you. So the very first option here they are saying is that the, uh, the stability of hydrides basically we are talking about the thermal stability okay. So the stability of hydrides increases from NH3 to BiH3 in group 15 of the periodic table. Now here basically we are talking about the hydrides of group 15 from NH3 to BiH3. So this is your statement 1. The next statement here is nitrogen cannot form D pi P pi bond. Next option the single N single N bond is weaker than the single P single P bond. And finally N2O4 has two resonating structures. So of these let's try to understand which all statements are correct first of all right. Now if you have a close look at option B that is nitrogen cannot form D pi P pi bond. Now if you notice this is a correct statement. Now we know the reason for this is that if I consider the atomic number of nitrogen is 7 and if I write its electronic configuration it is 1s2, 2s2, 2p3 right. So basically its outermost shell is the second shell which does not have vacant d orbital. There is no any orbital like 2d which is present in nitrogen. So if it doesn't have d orbitals then definitely it will not be able to form d pi p pi bond. Certainly it can form p pi p pi bonds right. It definitely can form p pi p pi bond but not d pi p pi bond. So definitely option b is a correct statement okay. Let's go on to uh, option c single n single bond n. This particular bond is weaker than single PP bond. Now if you consider here nitrogen, phosphorus, these are the relative position of these elements in group 15. So obviously nitrogen is higher in group 15 right. Now if I consider N single bond N and P single bond P right. Now here bond length actually depends on the internuclear distance. Basically internuclear distance is going to be the bond length isn't it and the strength of the bond will be dependent on the bond length. Shorter the bond length it will be difficult for us to break that particular bond right. It means the bond will be stronger. Now we know that as and when we are going down the group what happens to the atomic size? Atomic size definitely increases. So atomic size of phosphorus is greater than that of nitrogen and that's the reason when we say N single bond N this bond length is going to be shorter right. Whereas P single bond P bond length is relatively larger okay. So it is going to be longer compared to N single bond A right. So now if I consider here if N single bond N is shorter bond definitely as I told you it will require more energy to break that bond right and hence this particular bond is going to be stronger right. This particular bond is going to be stronger. So single N single bond N bond is weaker than single PP bond right. Now this is what we expect now N single bond should be stronger and P single P bond should be what weaker right. However when you consider the shorter uh, bond length it also gives rise to what inter electronic repulsion between two nitrogen atoms right. So because of very small size of nitrogen and we know that it has got 5 outermost electrons right. So if I consider two nitrogen atoms like this 
it has got a shorter bond length and because of the shorter bond length we should expect that the bond should be stronger right however because of the higher electron density around nitrogen right it is because of that the inter electronic repulsion is going to be more and if there is higher inter electronic repulsion then the electrons would want to go away from each other and hence we can easily break this bond so it is going from away from the conventional reasoning which we say right so if the bond is shorter the the bond should have been stronger but in this case because of the inter electronic repulsion it is going to be a weaker bond right so we can definitely say that single n n bond is weaker than the single pp bond why because in pp bond right even though it is relatively longer bond the repulsion is not that high and that's the reason it will hold on to the single bond strongly right okay moving on to the next option n2o4 has two resonating structures that is also actually uh, the correct statement so suppose if i am considering here the n2o4 so here you are having n single bond n double bond o single bond o single bond o double bond o right so of all these options if you see now definitely oxygen also has a lone pair of electrons here right and because of these lone pairs of electrons shifting of pi electrons will take place and hence you are going to get the resonating structures right now if you look at option a the stability of hydrides increases from nh3 to bih3 in group 15 now definitely this particular stability depends on the bond strength right now when I consider the bond strength, it also depends on the bond dissociation energy. So as and when we are going from nitrogen to bismuth, because there is increase in the atomic size, we can say that the bond length between element, this is group 15 element and hydrogen, this particular bond length is going to increase, right? And because the bond length is increasing, we can say that the bond dissociation energy will decrease. And because the bond dissociation energy is decreasing definitely, we can say that the thermal stability should decrease down the group, right? But if you notice here, they have given you the option A as stability is increasing from NH3 to BH. So definitely option A is your correct answer, right? Because that is a wrong statement here. I hope you got a clear understanding. Now, moving on with the next question here. Boron cannot form which of the following anions? So here you are having BF6 3 negative. BH4 negative, BOH4 negative and of course BO2 minus. Now if you have a close look at the very first structure which is nothing but BF6 3 negative and if we try to draw its Lewis structure, so we have its structure as if I consider boron it has got 5 outermost electrons right, 3 outermost electrons for boron, fluorine has got 7 outermost electrons right so multiplied by 6 obviously so this is going to be 42 this is 3 so total number of electrons here are 45 and you are going to add 3 more electrons so overall electrons will be 48 so number of electron pairs here will be 24 right now because there are 25 pairs of electrons if you want to distribute them so here you are going to have B F F F F F and F right and let's distribute these electrons here, these electron pairs. So this could be the Lewis structure of BF6 3 minus. But definitely, I'm sure you must be knowing that boron, because it is belonging to period number 2, it cannot expand its octet. It does not have additional d orbitals or it does not have vacant d orbitals. So if it cannot expand its octet, so definitely this particular structure cannot exist. This particular structure cannot exist because there is absence of d orbitals in boron, right? And because there is absence of d orbitals, it cannot expand its octet and hence definitely option A is going to be your correct answer. If you consider BH4 negative, in that the octet of boron will be complete, right? So here you could have B H4, obviously with a negative sign. So definitely here boron has its octet complete. So is the case with BOH4 negative. And if I consider BO2 negative, its structure is like this. B double bond O and of course there is a single bond O. And 
overall there is a negative charge. So of all these options, you will clearly be able to get the answer that is BF63 negative is not possible for boron, right? All right. So let's have a look at the next question here. That in which of the following arrangements, the sequence is not strictly according to the property which is written against it. So again, we have to look at the order, which is the correct order. We have to, you know, uh, identify that and which is incorrect order. We have to identify that. Okay. So the very first option, if you see, they're all oxides or dioxides which have been given to you. So here you are having CO2, SiO2, SnO2 and PbO2. They're asking you uh, that particular order is given for increasing oxidizing power. Okay. The second option is dealing with increasing acidic strength of these halo acids. Next is increasing basic strength of the hydrides of group 15. And finally, increasing first ionization energy for the elements of period number 2. Okay, so let's have a look at option A here first of all. Now if you notice, they are asking about the oxidizing power. Now just remember, when it comes to the oxidizing power of these oxides or dioxides, we can say that oxidizing power is proportional to the atomic size or ionic size of the element which is present associated with oxygen. So if you notice here carbon, silicon, tin and lead. So lead because it is having a higher atomic size or higher ionic size of Pb2+, plus, it is going to show a greater oxidizing strength. So PbO2 without any doubt is going to be a stronger oxidizing agent compared to SnO2, compared to SiO2 and finally CO2. Okay. So this particular order is correct order. All right. Next order here is increasing acidic strength. Now, if you have a close look here, you have H single bond F, H single bond Cl, H single bond Br and of course H single bond I. Right. These are all halo acids. Now, the acid which will be able to give away H plus ions easily will be a stronger acid. Now, without any doubt, we can say here that HI, right, because HI has, you know, iodine has a larger atomic size, this particular bond length is going to be larger, longer, and hence it can easily break to give rise to what H plus ions, and in fact, HF bond breaking will be very difficult, and that's the reason HF is weakest acid amongst all these halo acid, right? So HI is the strongest, then HBr, then HCl, then HF, right? It depends on the bond dissociation energy and how easily they'll be able to give away H plus ions. So definitely this particular option is also a correct option. Next, basic strength for these hydrides. So NH3, PH3, ASH3 and SBH. Now what they're saying is NH3 is the weakest base, SBH3 is the strongest base. Now let's try to understand this part. We know that as and when we go down the group, the atomic size increases and the basic strength of these hydrides, basic strength of these hydrides is given on the basis of their capacity to give away lone pairs of electrons, to donate their lone pairs of electrons. So they are all acting as a Lewis base. So nitrogen has a lone pair of electron, so is phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, right? Now the point here is, because nitrogen has a smaller atomic size, smaller atomic size, these lone pairs of electrons are concentrated in a very small region. And because these lone pairs are concentrated in a very small region, to locate them and to donate it to, let's say, H plus ion, it becomes easier. Okay. Whereas, as and when we are going down the group, because of increase in atomic size, we can say that lone pairs of electrons become more dispersed, okay, lone pairs of electrons become more dispersed and because they become more dispersed, it will be difficult to locate them and then donate it to what H plus ions, right. So without any doubt, we can say here that the electron donating capacity, lone pair of electrons, you know, that donating capacity as and when you go down the group for these elements, it will go on decreasing and because electron donating capacity decreases, we can say that basic strength also is going to decrease without any doubt, right? So in fact, NH3 should have had maximum basic characters of all these hydrides. 
right? So definitely this particular order is not the correct order, right? And finally, let's have a look at the next option also. Boron, less than carbon, less than oxygen, less than nitrogen, that is with respect to increasing first ionization enthalpy. Now we know that all of these, they belong to period number two and across the period when we go from left to right, the uh, ionization enthalpy is going to increase. So here nitrogen shows higher ionization enthalpy compared to oxygen. The reason for that is that nitrogen has 2p3 electronic configuration, which is half filled. Right? Whereas if I consider oxygen, it has got 2p4 electronic configuration, which is incompletely filled, right? Incompletely filled. So definitely nitrogen being more stable, it requires more energy to remove the electron. So definitely this particular order is also a correct order, right? So of all these options, you will realize that your answer should be option C, right? Because they're asking us to find the incorrect order. I hope you got a clear understanding how to approach these kind of questions. Moving on with the next question here. Which one of the following reactions of xenon compounds is not feasible? Not feasible, okay? So the very first reaction, they are saying XeO3 is reacting with HF. So you get XeF6, that is xenon hexafluoride with water. Next is hydrolysis of xenon tetrafluoride. Next option is hydrolysis of xenon difluoride. And of course, finally, XeF6 is reacting with rubidium fluoride. Now, we have to identify which of these reactions is not feasible. Now, the point here is we know that xenon fluorides, okay, xenon compounds, they have a very good tendency to get hydrolyzed, right? Now, if I'm saying that they have a very good tendency to get hydrolyzed, so as a product, in the product, if you're getting any xenon fluorides, then they will not remain as it is. If it is associated with water, then they further undergo hydrolysis. Now, if you have a close look, in all these reactions, in all these reactions, XeF6 is the one which is formed as a product. Now, rest of the reactions, if you notice, here you are having Xe with XeO3, Xe with 4HF, and of course, Rb, XeF7, right? So in option A, the moment XeF6 is formed along with water, it will get further hydrolyzed to give rise to XeO3 along with HF, right? So the point which I want to make here is, even though this reaction may take place, but it is not feasible because I'm not going to get a stable product because XeF6 will get further hydrolyzed to give you different products, right? So of all these reactions, you will realize that option A is your correct answer because this reaction is not going to be A visible reaction. I hope you got the clear understanding. Yeah. Moving on with the next question here. The structure of diborane, which is nothing but B2H6. It contains any of these options like 4, 2C, 2E. Now, what is the meaning of 2C? We, I'm sure you know it. 2 center and 2E when I say it is 2 electrons. So 2C, 2E bonds and 4, 3C, 2E bonds. Likewise, you are having different variations of the centers and the electrons. Now, when we consider the structure of B2H6, I'm sure you know that it is a dimer of BH3, right? It's a dimer of BH3 in which boron undergoes sp2 hybridization, right? So if I'm saying that boron is undergoing sp2 hybridization, so one of the boron, if I draw its hybrid orbitals here, so one, two, right, three, another boron, one, two, three, right? Now definitely these two boron atoms, they are connected to each other, right? So here, each of these boron is giving its one electron. So you can say here that it is 2C, two electrons, right? Now, apart from this, if you notice here, you are having hydrogen, 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 and of course, hydrogen, yeah? So now, if you notice here, you're having boron with hydrogen, B2H6, right? So we have already drawn here boron with four hydrogen atoms. Now, apart from sp2 hybridized orbital, each boron here is going to have a vacant p orbital, right? each boron is going to have a vacant p orbital. So I'm just drawing it like this. 
and let's suppose I'm drawing a vacant p orbital here like this, right? And of course, here you are going to have this sp2 hybridized orbital and this is going to be the sp2 hybridized orbital. Now remember here that hydrogen is here and of course one more hydrogen here. That's how we get B2H6 structure. Now, this is the vacant p orbital of boron and I can say here that this is the hybridized orbital of boron, right? And this is also a hybridized orbital of boron, wherein you are having hydrogen. Now the point here is boron, this particular orbital being vacant, it is not providing any electrons. However, hybrid orbital is going to provide the electron, so is the hydrogen. So definitely these two could be regarded as two centers or rather we are having three centers here. Three centers, two electrons, correct? Three centers, two electrons. Why three centers here? One, two, three. Right? And two electrons, why? Because one and two. So three center, two electrons. And of course, this is going to be boron and hydrogen. This is normal sigma bond, which involves two center, two electrons. So in all, if you consider, here you are going to have four, two centers, two electron system. Right? They will be signified by one, two, three, and four. So four, two center, two electrons. And of course, you are going to have two, right, three center, two electron system. So of all these options, I'm sure you'll be able to identify the correct option now that here it is option D, which is the correct answer, right? So this is actually related to the structure of diborane and of course, this looks like a banana bond, right? It is regarded as a banana bond here, which is involving what bridge hydrogen atoms. Okay, moving on with the next part here. So the question here is the soldiers of Napoleon army, while at the Alps during freezing winter, they suffered a serious problem as regards to the tin buttons of their uniforms. While here having white metallic tin buttons, they got converted to gray powder. So this transformation is related to, so these are the options which are given to you. Very first, a change in the crystalline structure of tin interaction with nitrogen in the air at very low temperatures, the change in the partial pressure of the oxygen in the air, and finally, interaction with water vapors contained in the humid air. Okay, now the very first thing here we need to understand that definitely option B cannot be the answer because nitrogen as such is not reactive at room temperature. So if you are further considering the lower temperature, it is not going to react at all. Also, partial pressure of oxygen is not affected because, you know, uh, and if it is not affected, then definitely it is not going to give rise to any specific change in what tin. And finally, interaction with water vapors contained in the humid air, that is also not possible. So your answer basically is option A. So what really happens is, when I consider the stable crystalline form of tin at room temperature, it is basically beta, okay, right, which is a white crystalline substance, okay, white crystalline metal and it has got tetragonal geometry, right. However, when you are reducing the temperature to a very low level, if I consider the temperature which is, you know, approximately around 13 degrees or lesser than that, okay, less than that. So in that case, what happens is there is a transformation of beta 10 taking place to alpha 10. And it basically gets converted into a gray colored powder. Wherein actually its structure changes from tetragonal structure to cubic structure. Right? So because there is change in the crystalline form, you will realize that there are problems associated at lower temperature as far as tin is concerned. So option A, if you notice here, is going to be your correct answer because it involves the change in the crystalline form of the tin. So it changes basically from tetragonal shape to the cubic shape. And all the more, tetragonal has relatively higher density and this particular form will have a lower density. And that's the reason, you know, it, it actually turns into a grayish colored powder and that was a problem associated. Yeah, all right. So moving on with the next part here, again, next question. 
for H3PO3 and H3PO4, the incorrect choice. Now here they are asking to find again the incorrect choice that H3PO3 is diabasic and reducing, H3PO3 is diabasic and non-reducing, H3PO4 is tribasic and reducing and finally H3PO3 is tribasic and non-reducing. So first and foremost thing, let us try to draw the structures of these two acids, right? That is H3PO3 phosphorus acid and H3PO4 that is phosphoric acid. So if I consider here these structures, so here you are going to have P double bond O, right? This bond has to be there into any of the oxy acid or phosphorus, POH, right? POH and of course this is H, right? Now this is the structure of H3PO3. Now if I draw the structure of H3PO4, here you are going to have P double bond O. POH, POH and of course POH, right? Now in H3PO3, you will realize that there are two acidic hydrogens which are present. So if these H plus ions are gone, right? So one mole of H3PO3 can produce two moles of H plus ions. So we say they are replaceable H plus ions and hence it is going to be di-basic, right? However, if you notice H3PO4, H plus, H plus as well as this H plus, three H plus ions are gone. So we can say it could be regarded as what tri basic, right? So one thing is clear that option D is not the correct answer because here it is showing that H3PO3 is a tri basic acid, right? Now, next part they're asking is with respect to their reducing nature. Now, any substance can act as a reducing agent only if it gets easily oxidized, right? Now, if you notice that in H3PO3, the oxidation state of phosphorus is plus 3. Whereas in H3PO4, the oxidation state of phosphorus is plus 5, right? Now, we know that maximum possible oxidation state of phosphorus is plus 5, right? So definitely, if I consider this H3PO4, it cannot further be oxidized. Now, if it cannot further be oxidized, definitely it cannot behave as a reducing agent, right? However, if you consider this phosphorus in uh, phosphorus acid, it is having intermediate oxidation state, I would say, right? Plus 3. Now, this plus 3 can get converted into plus 5. That means phosphorus can be oxidized. If it can be oxidized, definitely this particular acid can behave as a reducing agent. Right? It can behave as a reducing agent. Whereas phosphoric acid cannot behave as a reducing agent. Right? So if you look at option C, that H3PO4 is tri-basic and it is reducing. So because of this particular statement, whole statement is wrong. Right? And that's the reason that is your answer. I hope you got the clear understanding. Okay. The next question here is, which of the following has a peroxide linkage? Now, this question again is based on the oxy acids, but it is dealing with the oxy acids of sulfur. So if I consider the very first acid here, that is nothing but H2S2O6. And if I try to draw its structure, first of all, the name of this acid is something which you call as dithionic acid. Okay. And its structure is simple. It's going to be S, single bond S, double bond O, double bond O, double bond O, double bond O. And of course, here you are going to have OH. This is also going to be OH, right? This is the structure of diethionic acid. Now, if you look at the structure of H2S2O3, it is actually thiosulfuric acid. And if it is thiosulfuric acid, its structure is, it's like this S, double bond S, double bond O, OH, OH. This is H2, S2, O3. If you look at the structure of H2, S4, O6, it is actually tetrathionic acid. H2, S4, O6 is tetrathionic acid, which is basically S, 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 S. Of course, double bond O, double bond O, double bond O, double bond O. Here you are going to have OH and here also you are going to have OH. Now, if you notice, in all these structures, 
you are not able to find any peroxide linkage. So definitely these are not your answers, right? If you have a close look, option B is actually going to be your correct answer, which we call it as peroxy disulfuric acid, okay? Which is also regarded as Marshall's acid. Okay, so if I draw its structure, it's it's going to be like this S double bond O, double bond O, OH, and here you are going to have a peroxide linkage, S double bond O, double bond O, OH. So if you notice, this is the structure of H2, S2, OH, wherein you are going to have a peroxide linkage, right? So this is definitely going to be your answer. Next question here, when I minus is oxidized by KMnO4, in alkaline medium, very important in alkaline medium, then I minus converts into, now here it is actually a fact based question. Now here you need to remember that I minus is going to get oxidized to IO3 minus, okay. So if I want to write the reaction here, it is going to be KMnO4 reacts with Ki, considering that I minus is coming from Ki, okay. In aqueous medium. So here, because we are considering that alkaline medium is there, basic medium is there, KMnO4 obviously is going to get converted into MnO2 and along with that you are going to get KOH and of course KiO3. Of course, it is not a balanced reaction but if you notice here, I minus is getting converted into what? IO3 minus. So if I write the balanced reaction here, this is going to be 2 here this will be 2 here and of course this is also going to be 2. Simple, straightforward. See, they are not asking you to balance this reaction but you need to understand that I minus here gets converted to IO3 minus wherein the oxidation state of I is going to be plus 5. Okay, so from minus 1 it changes to plus 5. Right? Okay. Moving on to the next part here, next question. Oxygen is more electronegative than sulphur yet H2S is acidic in nature while H2 is neutral. Now, again the acidic behavior of these hydrides. Now, when I talk about H2S and H2O, we can say they are nothing but the hydrides of group 16 elements. Simple, right? Now, again their acidic behavior is dependent on the bond dissociation energy. Simple as that. Bond dissociation energy. So, if I consider H O H and H S H, right? Without any doubt, sulfur has a larger atomic size compared to oxygen. Now, because it is having a larger atomic size, this particular bond length will be longer and hence, we will be able to break this bond easily. And if it is able to break this bond easily, it will be able to release H plus easily. Yes or no? Whereas, because of the smaller size and higher electronegativity of oxygen, to break this particular bond, it's a difficult task. And hence, it is not going to furnish very high number of H plus ions into the solution and that's the reason precisely it is a neutral molecule, right? So we can say that SH will be able to furnish H plus ions easily. Why? Because its bond dissociation energy is lesser. And why its bond dissociation energy is lesser? Because the bond is weaker, isn't it? And that's the reason. Option C will be your correct answer that HS is weaker than OH bond, right? So whenever the, they are asking any question pertaining to the acidic strength of hydrides of the, you know, group 15, 16 or 17 elements or for that matter 13 or 14 elements as well, then in that case, please talk in the context or you have to, you know, visualize in the context of what? The bond dissociation energy, okay? So moving on with the next part here, the structure of XeO3F2. Now, uh, you can definitely expect some question like this based on either the geometry or the shape or the number of bond pairs or lone pairs of electrons. So, so just so you have to have a clear understanding of these kind of uh, questions, right? Now, when we talk about XeO3F2 and we know how to draw its Lewis structures, right? So if I draw the Lewis structure of XeO3F2, so it's like this, double bond O, double bond O, double bond O, right? And of course, here you are having F and F. Now, if you notice here, 
xenon is surrounded by five electron domains and there are no lone pairs all are bond pairs so basically if i draw its geometrical figure it's going to be like this xe double bond o double bond o double bond o so it is going to be into a triangular structure triangular shape one fluorine up here one fluorine will be down so we can say here that this is basically a triangular structure with two pyramids right so we can say that it is a trigonal bipyramidal structure trigonal bipyramidal structure so option c is your correct answer likewise they can ask you any question which is based on the geometry of xenon compound so they can ask you maybe for xef4 or xeo3 could be different other compounds as well just stick to the basics of finding the lewis structure counting the number of electron domains how many bond pairs how many lone pairs are there and accordingly you can determine the geometry or the shape of the molecule moving on with the next question which has the lowest boiling point now see here when it comes to these hydrates that is nh3 ph3 ash3 sbh3 right now as and when we go down the group so nh3 ph3 ash3 sbh3 right now when we go down the group atomic size definitely is increasing right and if the atomic size is increasing we can say that the molecular size also is going to increase yes or no molecular size is also going to increase and the molecular size is increasing we can say that the extent of intermolecular forces will also increase right and if there is increase in extent of intermolecular forces then quite obvious the molecules will be placed quite close to each other and because of which you will have to supply relatively larger amount of energy to separate them and hence without any doubt boiling point will increase right so ideally speaking the order should have been sbh3 should have maximum boiling point followed by ash3 then ph3 and then nh3 now if you go by this order your answer should be nh3 right but that is not the correct option the reason for that i'm sure you must be knowing that if i consider nh3 it shows the presence of hydrogen bonding which is relatively stronger compared to the van der waals interactions which should be present in these hydrides okay so sbh3 ash3 or ph3 none of these are capable of forming hydrogen bond and nitrogen because of its higher electronegativity it will be able to form hydrogen bond remember f o n phone these are the elements which are capable of forming hydrogen bond right and because of this nh3 in fact is going to have maximum boiling point right so now if i put this order like this if you realize here ph3 of all these hydrides will have least boiling point right because after nh3 you could have sbh3 then ash3 and finally ph3 so definitely here your answer should be b i hope you got the understanding here so the next question here is which of the following is true for hno2 for hno2 so it is very stable in aqueous solution it cannot act as both oxidant as well as reductant it cannot act as an oxidizing agent and finally it cannot act as a reducing agent now when we consider hno2 here if you notice oxidation state of nitrogen is going to be plus 3 okay now nitrogen can show maximum possible oxidation state of plus 5 right so here it can get oxidized to nitrogen in which oxidation state could be plus 5 one of the example here could be what hno3 right or it can get reduced to lower oxidation states like if i say just n2 where in oxidation state is zero so the point is because nitrogen here is showing intermediate oxidation number of plus 3 it can get oxidized or it can get reduced depending on the situation depending on the condition and hence it can behave as both oxidizing as well as reducing agent right so definitely option b will not be a correct option right now it cannot act as an oxidizing agent not possible because here you can say that it can be reduced that's the reason it will behave as an oxidizing agent right so this statement is also not correct 
it cannot act as a reducing agent. Definitely here, it is going to behave like a reducing agent if it is getting oxidized, right? So all these three statements are wrong. So without any doubt, your answer should be option A, that it is stable in its aqueous solution. Yeah? I hope you got the understanding. Now, remember, apart from HNO2, there could be certain other compounds which will show both oxidizing and reducing properties. You have to check with respect to the oxidation number and if the oxidation number comes out to be the intermediate oxidation number, then they can behave as both. Like for example, sulfur dioxide, right? In sulfur dioxide, the oxidation state of sulfur is plus 4. So it can get oxidized to plus 6 or it can get reduced to lower oxidation state as well. So that's the reason we can say that SO2 is acting as both oxidizing as well as reducing agent, right? So I hope you got the understanding. Let's move on with the next question here. The PPP bond angle in white phosphorus is 120 degrees, 109.5 degrees, 90 degrees and 60 degrees. Now this is again a fact based question. We know that the structure of white phosphorus is like this. It's a closed cage-like structure wherein phosphorus atoms, they are kind of uh, crumble in a relatively smaller area, right? With this particular bond angle being 60 degrees. And it is because of this, actually, there's something which you call it as angular strain. And because of this angular strain, we can say that white phosphorus shows higher reactivity. Actually speaking, this bond angle should have been 90 degrees. But because of the structure, its bond angle is found to be 60 degrees. So phosphorus atoms would want to go away from each other uh, by breaking the bonds. And that's the reason it shows higher reactivity, right? So as far as this question is concerned, your answer should be option D, that is 60 degrees. Yeah? The next quad, chlorine acts as a bleaching agent only in presence of. Now we have studied this, the bleaching action of chlorine, right? So it will act as a bleaching agent only in presence of moisture as such. Why so? Because when we consider chlorine, it combines with water, it will produce two acids. I'm sure you know it. That is nothing but HCl and HOCl. HCl is definitely hydrochloric acid. HOCl is hypochlorous acid. Hypochlorous acid. And this hypochlorous acid in water itself, it gets dissociated, it gets decomposed to HCl again and it is going to release this nascent oxygen. Now this nascent oxygen is responsible for the bleaching action of chlorine. And chlorine is able to generate that only when it is combining with water, right? That's the reason it will act as a bleaching agent only in presence of moisture. Okay, so moving on with the next part here, next question. When KMnO4 acts as an oxidizing agent and ultimately forms MnO4 2 minus, MnO2, Mn2O3 and Mn2 plus, then the number of electrons transferred in each case, they have given you certain numbers here. Okay, so let's have a quick look here that MnO4 minus is changing into different substances here. So very first here could be what? MnO4 2 minus, next is MnO2, you have Mn2O3 and finally you have Mn2 plus, right? Now we just have to consider the oxidation number. So Mn here has the oxidation number of plus 7, right? In MnO4 2 minus its oxidation state is plus 6. In MnO2, its oxidation state is plus 4. Mn2O3 oxidation state is plus 3. And finally, here it is plus 2. So if you notice in the first case, the change in oxidation state is by just one unit. And that's the reason for the first reaction, it is going to accept one electron, one mole of electrons, right? Next, the change in oxidation state from plus 7 to plus 4, definitely it will accept three electrons here. From plus 7, it goes to plus 3, so it is definitely going to accept 4 electrons. And finally, from plus 7, it is going to plus 2. 
So the change in oxidation state is by phi and hence it is going to accept five electrons, right? So you will realize that in the first reaction, one electron, second, three, third, fourth, uh, four electrons and finally the uh, five electrons so that matches to your option C, one, three, four, five, right? So this will be your correct option, that is option C. Now understand that MnO4 minus changes into MnO2. So here I'll just give you one mnemonic that is nothing but ban 1, 5, 3. Now this is exclusively only for KmnO4, this is just for remembrance purpose. Now B here stands for basic medium, A stands for acidic medium and N here stands for neutral medium. So if it is basic medium, the change in oxidation state here is by 1. Acidic medium, change in oxidation state is by 5 and if it is neutral medium, change is by 3. So here this will be basic, right? This will be neutral and this could be what acidic medium, right? I hope you got the clear understanding here. So moving on with the next part here, the ammonia forms the complex ion Cu NH342 positive tetra ammonium copper, tetra amine copper, sorry. With copper ions in alkaline medium, but not in acidic medium, not in acidic medium. So what is the reason for this? So in acidic medium, protons coordinate with ammonia, forming NH4 plus ions and NH3 molecules are not available. In alkaline solution, the insoluble copper hydroxide is precipitated, which is soluble in excess of any alkali. Next is copper hydroxide is amphoteric substance and finally acidic solution, the hydration protects the copper ions. Now we know that this particular uh, compound is a coordinate entity, yes or no, coordinate complex, wherein ammonia molecule is behaving like a ligand. So when ammonia is behaving like a ligand, it is donating its lone pair of electrons to copper ions, right? And that's how the process will take place, yes or no? So the lone pair of electrons must be available to copper ions so that there will be a formation of a coordinate bond. However, if you are using the acidic medium, it may so happen that NH3 can combine with H plus ion and it will produce what NH4 plus ions. Now because of this, the lone pairs of electrons on nitrogen, they are not available to be given to copper ions and that's the reason we should not carry out this reaction in acidic medium, rather we should carry out in what? The alkaline medium. So your answer here should be option A, right? That the solution, in the acidic solution, the protons, they will coordinate with all ammonia molecules. You can see here protons will form a coordinate bond with ammonia molecule, they will form ammonium ions and that's the reason NH3 will not be available for forming a coordinate bond with copper ions. The next question here is, what would happen when a solution of potassium chromate is treated with an excess of dilute nitric acid? Potassium chromate is treated with excess of dilute nitric acid. So basically here we are dealing with the acidic medium, okay, we are dealing with what? The acidic medium. Now we know that Chromate, potassium chromate is nothing but CrO4 2 minus, right? And in this CrO4 2 minus, the oxidation state of chromium is nothing but plus 6. Now, can we say that oxidation state here is plus 6, which is the maximum possible oxidation state? So, one thing is very much clear that chromium ions cannot get further oxidized here. So, option C, if you see, CrO4 2 negative is oxidized to plus 7 state of chromium. This is definitely not the correct because chromium will never exist as plus 7 oxidation state, okay? Now, if you look at option B, CrO4 2 negative is reduced to plus 3 state of chromium. Now, if we say that CrO4 2 negative in which the oxidation state is plus 6, if it is reduced to Cr3 plus, what does that mean is HNO3 must get oxidized wherein oxidation state of nitrogen is plus 5, right? Now again we say that nitrogen here is having maximum possible oxidation state, so it cannot be further oxidized. So if it cannot be further oxidized, definitely this reaction is also not possible in presence of HNO3, right? So option B will also not be a correct choice here. 
So we are left with option A and D. Now, if you look at option D, again you are having CR3 plus. The moment you see CR3 plus, definitely it will not change it to CR3 plus, right? So it's just that CRO42 negative changes into dichromate ion and water is formed. So basically here, if I write the reaction, we are going to have K2CRO4. As I told you, it is CRO42 negative. So potassium dichromate along with HNO3. So two potassium dichromate, two HNO3. Here you are going to get K2Cr2O7. That is nothing but potassium dichromate. Now, if you notice here, in this case, there is no change in oxidation number. Here oxidation state is plus 6. Here also it is plus 6. So potassium chromate changes to potassium dichromate. Along with, you are going to get formation of KNO3 plus H2O. Right? So it is basically just the rearrangement. Now, so remember that in acidic medium, in acidic medium, potassium dichromate, uh, dichromate actually predominates. But if it is alkaline medium, it is going to be potassium chromate. So here the interchanging of CrO4 2 negative takes place with Cr2O7 2 negative. Okay. So if it is acidic medium, you will get dichromate. If it is alkaline medium, you are going to get chromate ions. I hope you get this clear understanding. So definitely option A is going to be your correct answer here. Yes? So moving on with the next part here. How many EDTA? Now we know that EDTA is nothing but ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. Or we can also say it is ethylene diamine tetraacetic which is obviously acting as a ligand. So how many EDTA molecules are required to make an octahedral complex with the ions, right? Now here they are asking uh, how many EDTA molecules will be required for octahedral complex. So 1, 2, 6 or 3. Now we very well know that EDTA is nothing but hexadentate ligand, okay? EDTA is nothing but hexadentate dented ligand, right? If I'm saying that it is hexadented ligand, it means what one molecule is going to provide six donor atoms. So if I look at the structure here of ethylene diamine, so here you are going to have CH2, CH2, N, CH2, C double bond O, O negative, CH2, C double bond O, O negative, right? Other side also, you will have the similar structure. So CH2, C double bond O, O negative. CH2, C double bond O, O negative. So definitely 1, 2, 3, 4. Nitrogen also has a lone pair. 5 and 6. These are 6 donor atoms. And that's the reason when there's a formation of a coordinate complex, with the central metal atom here, okay, all the six will be denoted or will be given by one single EDTA molecule. That's the reason the answer should be A, right? Because in octahedral complex, you are going to have six electron domains, six coordinate bonds, which will be formed by only one single molecule of EDTA. I hope this is clear. Okay, so moving on to the next question, the outer electronic configuration of gadolinium which has atomic number of 64. Now, gadolinium, as we know that it is belonging to F block elements, right? And in fact, it is belonging to 4F series, okay? It is belonging to what 4F series? And the electronic configuration is Xe, right? 4F7, 5D1, 6S2. This is the electronic configuration of gadolinium. So if I'm talking about the outer electronic configuration, definitely your option D is your correct answer, right? Rest of the options obviously do not match with this. So please, uh, you should know how to write the electronic configurations precisely for the F block elements. They're going to ask you any one of the atom or the element and of course it's electronic configuration. So please learn these electronic configurations, okay? The next question, ion exhibits plus 2 and plus 3 oxidation states. Which of the following statements about ion is incorrect? Yeah, 
So the options here are ferrous oxide is more basic in nature than ferric oxide. Ferrous compounds are relatively more ionic than the corresponding ferric compounds. Then the ferrous compounds are less volatile than the corresponding ferric compounds. And finally, ferrous compounds are more easily hydrolyzed than corresponding ferric compounds. So first and foremost thing, we know that if I consider ferrous oxide, here you are going to have FeO, right? And if I consider ferric oxide, you are having Fe2O3. Now, without any doubt, in FeO, the oxidation state is plus 2. In Fe2O3, oxidation state is plus 3, ferric ions, right? Now, I have told you already that the basic nature of these oxides generally depends on the atomic size as well, atomic size or ionic size. So if I consider Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus ions, you will realize that Fe2 plus will be having relatively larger size compared to Fe3 plus, okay, because of relatively lesser nuclear charge. And that's the reason ferrous oxide is more basic in nature compared to ferric oxide. Definitely this particular statement is a correct statement. Next, ferrous compounds are relatively more ionic than corresponding ferric compounds. Now this statement is also a true statement. Why? Because when I consider Fe2+, because of the smaller charge, it will not be able to, you know, carry out the polarization to a greater extent with oxide ion. However, if I say Fe3 plus ions, and if you are obviously having the oxide ions here, the extent of polarization will be relatively larger, relatively more with Fe3 plus. And because there is a greater polarization, Right, because there is a greater polarization, Fe2O3 will show greater extent of covalent characters, in other words, lesser ionic characters. So we can say that FeO is more ionic compared to FeO, Fe2O3, right? So definitely this particular statement is also correct. Next, ferrous compounds are less volatile than the corresponding ferric compounds. That is also true. Why? Because if ferrous compounds like FeO, if it is showing the higher, uh, you know, ionic character, okay, higher ionic character, then we can say that it is going to be having stronger intermolecular interactions, like in terms of what electrostatic force of attraction, and hence, they will be less volatile. So definitely, this particular option is also correct, right? And finally, ferrous compounds are more easily hydrolyzed than the corresponding ferric compounds. Now, this particular statement is not the correct statement. Okay. In fact, ferrous compounds are less readily hydrolyzed and that's the reason your option D is the correct answer. I hope you got the logical understanding of all these options and how do you identify the option D as the correct answer here. Okay. The next question here is the amount of oxalic acid which is present in a solution can be determined by its titration with KMnO4 solution in presence of H2SO4, in the presence of sulfuric acid. The titration gives unsatisfactory result when it is carried out in the presence of HCl. So the role which is played by H2SO4 is to furnish H plus ions which can also be done by HCl, right? However, this reaction we are carrying out only in presence of H2SO4, not in presence of HCl. Reason for that, we know that KMnO4 is relatively stronger oxidizing agent, right? Now, it definitely can oxidize the oxalic acid, right? Definitely it is going to oxidize oxalic acid. But if there is a presence of Cl- in the solution, that can also be oxidized towards chlorine, okay? So this oxidation will take place with the help of KMnO4. So KMnO4 along with oxidizing the oxalic acid, it will oxidize the chloride ions from HCl as well, okay. So if you are having obviously the sulphide ions in that in which the sulphur already has an oxidation state of plus 6, sulphur cannot be further oxidized, right. So it is just going to act as an acidic medium, it is going to furnish what H plus ions. So if you consider the first option that HCl gets oxidized by oxid, uh, oxalic acid to chlorine. Now, if you notice, it is partially correct statement. But the problem here is what? It is not getting oxidized by oxalic acid. It is getting oxidized by KMnO4. That's the reason I cannot have this as my correct answer. Furnishes H plus ions in addition to those from oxalic acid. Now, that is precisely the, uh, the main aim which we are looking at, HCl or H2SO4. They are able to give H plus ions, right? So definitely not the correct one. 
it reduces permanganate to Mn2 plus. Now, definitely this is your answer. As I told you earlier as well, that if I'm using KMnO4 as an oxidizing agent in acidic medium, then KMnO4 changes into Mn2 plus. So basically from plus seven, the oxidation state changes to plus two, right? So because of this uh, reduction, obviously it is behaving like an oxidizing agent, right? So it reduces permanganate to Mn2 plus and of course HCl itself gets oxidized to chlorine gas, right? Which is a definitely disadvantage here. And oxidizes oxalic acid to carbon dioxide and water, it is not possible for HCl to act as an oxidizing agent here, right? So of all these options, definitely your option C is going to be the correct answer. I hope you got the clear understanding here, yeah? So moving on with the next part here, next question. Which of the following complex species is not expected to exhibit optical isomerism? Now, when we talk about the optical isomerism, the, uh, you know, images, mirror images should be non-superimposable mirror images of each other. And they should not have a plane of symmetry, right? Now, if you notice here, considering the first option CO, EN, which is basically ethylene diamine, okay? So there are three molecules of ethylene diamine. So if I consider this as an octahedral complex here, so this could be EN, this could be EN, and of course this could also be what EN. And if I draw a mirror image here, right, it is going to show, right, mirror image like this, which is definitely non-superimposable mirror image, right? So option A is going to show optical isomerism. If you look at option B, also is going to show optical isomerism and to be more precise, it's cis isomer, it's cis isomer. So if I consider here, CO, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, CL, CL, EN, EN. Now definitely, when you put a mirror here, you are going to get non-superimposable mirror image, right? So it's this isomer will be able to show optical isomerism and same is the case with option D as well, okay? So all these three compounds, they are capable of showing optical isomerism. However, if you look at option C, it will not be able to show optical isomerism. Reason for that, it is actually going to have fat or mer isomerism, facial and meridional axis, right? So I'll just draw one of the uh, structure here. So if you consider CO, one, two, three, four, five, and six, of course here. So let's suppose here I'm drawing CL, 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 and here you are having NH3, NH3, and of course NH3. So you will realize here that, you know, these are nothing but vertices, like NH3 is present at the vertices of the octahedral complex, and hence they are present along one single phase. Now, so is the case with these fluorine atoms, right? So this could be regarded as what facial isomer. Likewise, you could also have meridional isomer here. So these compounds, they will not be able to show optical isomerism, okay? And that's the reason option C is going to be your correct answer. Why? Because in this particular structure, you will have a plane of symmetry. It is going to have POS, plane of symmetry, right? Okay. Next part, next question. Which of the following facts about the complex CR, NH36, CL3 is wrong? It's wrong, okay? So the first one, it involves D2 sp3 hybridization. It involves D2 sp3 hybridization and it is octahedral in shape. The complex is paramagnetic. The complex is outer orbital complex. And finally, it gives a white precipitate with silver nitrate solution, okay? Now, if you consider this particular complex, first of all, we know that atomic number of chromium is 24. So its electronic configuration is AR, 4S1, 3D5, right? And in this particular complex, because of its oxidation number being plus three, we can say that its electronic configuration is going to be what? AR, 4S0, 3D3, right? So if we, if we consider here the 3D orbital, right? 
4s, 4p and of course I will also write this as 4d. Yeah. Now in this 3d orbitals you are going to have 3 electrons like this okay and along with that you are having 4s, 4p and 4d as well. Now what happens is when ammonia ligand it is approaching the chromium right. So basically uh, because of the strong field nature of NH3 the pairing of electrons will take place here and these two d orbitals will actually undergo hybridization. So you will have D2SP3 you are going to get these hybrid orbitals. So they, that will give rise to what D2SP3 hybridization. And because it is giving rise to D2 sp3 hybridization, it is 3D orbital which is involved in hybridization. And that's the reason we can say that it should be an inner orbital complex and not the outer orbital complex, right? So definitely this particular option is your correct answer here, right? So it is, it involves D2 sp3 hybridization, it is octahedral in shape, definitely yes, because there are going to be six electron domains. It is paramagnetic, why? Because it is going to have unpaired electrons and finally it gives a white precipitate with silver nitrate solution. That's also correct, why? Because the counter ion here is chloride ion which will produce a precipitate of what? AgCl, right? So option C is your correct answer here. Moving on with the next question here, the magnetic moment which is basically spin only for NiCl4 2 negative is. Now here, if you consider the atomic number of nickel as 28, so its electronic configuration is AR 4s2 3d8, right? Now if I consider here Ni2 plus which is the oxidation state in this particular complex, so its electronic configuration will be 4s0 3d8. So if I write the d electronic configuration here, so 1, 2, 3, 4. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8. So basically there are two unpaired electrons which are present. And the formula to find the magnetic moment here is equal to square root of n times n plus 2, right? This is the direct formula if you want to find the magnetic moment, spin only. So here n is nothing but number of unpaired electron. So basically here you are going to have 2 times 2 plus 2. So you have square root of 8 which is equal to 2.82 Bohr magneton, okay? It is as good as square root of 9 which is uh, 3. So your answer should be closer to 3. So definitely your answer is 2.82 Bm Bohr magneton, yeah? So this was a question which is based on finding the magnetic moment. Likewise, they can ask you any other complex. Your idea here should be to find the number of unpaired electrons and put those, uh, you know, here into this particular formula, that's it. You just need to plug in the values, you will get the answer for what magnetic moment. And based on this magnetic moment, also we can determine uh, the strength of magnetic behavior of a particular coordinate complex, okay? Now going ahead with the next question, which one of the following has a square planar geometry? So options here are CO, CL4 2 negative, FeCl4 2 negative, NiCl4 2 negative and PtCl4 2 negative. Now we very well know that Cl minus which is basically a halogen, it is actually a weak field ligand and if it is a weak field ligand then we can expect that there is no pairing of electrons, right? No pairing of electrons will take place. And if there is no pairing of electrons taking place, then the expected geometry here should be tetrahedral if there is a coordination number of 4, okay? So the complexes in which the coordination number is 4 with chloride as a ligand, then we can say that they are expected to show the tetrahedral geometry. Now if you notice in all these options, that is CO, CL4, FeCl4, NiCl4 and PtCl4, everywhere the ligands are chloride ions, right? So ideally speaking, all of them should be showing the tetrahedral geometry. However, 
it is PtCl42 negative which does not show tetrahedral rather it shows relatively more energy content uh, higher energy value DSP2 hybridization uh, basically square planar geometry. Square planar geometry will be uh, having higher energy content compared to the tetrahedral geometry remember but PtCl42 negative can afford to do that. Reason for that if you notice cobalt, iron and nickel they all belong to 3D series, 3D series whereas platinum here it is belonging to 4D series and if you consider the outer configuration of platinum here is 4, 4D8 right and the point here is when it comes to these 4D orbitals these orbitals are relatively larger. Okay, relatively larger compared to 3D orbitals. Okay, and because they are relatively larger compared to 3D orbitals, we can say that the electrons are more diffused. And because of which, even though Cl minus is there, which is a weak field again, we can say that the you know DD splitting energy is higher right. So because of this what is happening is because of the more diffuse nature of d orbitals of platinum the the bonding overlapping is more towards d orbitals and that's the reason rather than undergoing sp3 hybridization it can afford to undergo dsp2 hybridization and because it is undergoing dsp2 hybridization we can say that it is undergoing square planar structure it is having a square, square planar molecule or the geometry right. So I hope you got the understanding here this is one of the exceptional case please be careful about it okay. Next which of the following cyano complexes would exhibit the lowest value of paramagnetic behavior. Now if you want to understand the paramagnetic behavior obviously we need to have a clear idea with respect to the number of unpaired electrons which will be present in the complex right and we very well know that CN negative is actually a strong field ligand and if it is a strong field ligand generally we say that there will be pairing of electrons will take place okay. So if I consider first and foremost thing cobalt right so here oxidation state of cobalt is 3 positive right. In this case Fe is also 3 positive, here Mn is also 3 positive and Cr is also 3 positive. So if we write the electronic configurations right, so Fe3 plus first and foremost thing right, its configuration is going to be what Ar 4s0 3d5 right, this is going to be the configuration for Fe3 plus. Next is for cobalt oxidation number plus 3, so it is going to be Ar 4s0 3d6 simple here you are going to have cr3 plus right so here you will have ar 4s0 3d3 right and finally you will have mn3 plus it's going to be ar 4s0 3d4 so if you if you look at these configurations 1 2 3 4 so these are 1 2 3 4 5 electrons here for Fe3 plus for cobalt I will draw it like this 1 2 3 4 again so 1 2 3 4 5 and of course 6 this is for chromium and of course for Mn so 1 2 3 for Mn 1 2 3 and 4. Now because we are dealing with Cn negative cyanide ion which is as I told you it is a strong field ligand there will be pairing of electrons which will take place. So if the pairing of electron is taking place here we can say first thing that these electrons will undergo pairing these electrons will undergo pairing right. So you will be left with one unpaired electron here right one unpaired electron. Now two electrons are already paired for CO3 plus. Now two electrons here, two electrons here, they can undergo pairing. Now because all of these are undergoing pairing here, we can say that this will remain, this will have zero unpaired electron, right. 
In this case, chromium as well as manganese here you are having three unpaired electrons. And even, even if it is undergoing pairing, we can say they are having one unpaired electrons and here you are having four, right? So in all these cases, if you notice, it is this particular complex which will have zero unpaired electrons. Right? And because it is having zero unpaired electrons, definitely it will not have any magnetic moment and that's the reason here your answer should be A. Right? I hope you got the clear understanding how to go about. So whenever they're asking you about the paramagnetic behavior or for that matter diamagnetic behavior, please look at the number of unpaired electrons. Yeah? Next part here, next question. One mole of the complex compound, this is the complex compound which is given to you. CO NH3 5 Cl3. It gives three moles of ions on dissolution in water. One mole of the same complex it reacts with two moles of AgNO3 to yield two moles of AgCl. Now the moment they say two moles of AgCl it means it should be able to furnish two chloride ions. Okay. So the question here is the structure of the complex is so these are the options. So very first option, if you notice here, this is the coordinate complex and these are, this is the counter ion, Cl. Now outside the coordinate entity or uh, complex, you are having only one chloride. So when it dissociates, first and foremost thing, it is going to give us only two ions, right? It is going to give us only two ions. So, you know, as per the question, it is giving us how many ions? Three, right? So definitely that cannot be your answer and all the more, if, you are, if it is just producing one Cl minus, it is going to give only one mole of AgCl. Option B, if you have a closed loop, it is going to produce three ions without any doubt. And if it is producing three ions here, so it is satisfying the first condition. Second condition, because outside this coordination uh, complex, you are having two chlorides, right? So it is going to generate two chloride ions and that's the reason that is going to give rise to two AgCl, correct? So definitely this will be your answer. Option C definitely cannot be the answer because chloride ions are not outside the coordination complex, right? So option B will be your correct answer here, okay? Next question. One of the question they may ask you is based on the IUPAC nomenclature, okay? So the IUPAC nomenclature for this particular complex CO NO2 NH35Cl2 is. Now here we know that NO2 is basically a kind of ambidented ligand. NH3, we already know it is amine, right? So because of its alphabetical order, amine is going to come first. So we can have it as pentaamine, pentaamine, nitrito, okay? And here the connection is through nitrogen. That's the reason we are putting here N. So pentaamine, nitrito, N, cobalt chloride. Now the question mark here is what is the oxidation state of cobalt? So without any doubt the oxidation state of cobalt here is plus 3. And because its oxidation state is plus 3, if you notice here option C is going to be your correct answer, right? Pentaamine nitrito N cobalt chloride. Yeah? Let's have a look at one more question. Which of the following complexes is an outer orbital complex, outer orbital complex, right? Now again, if you notice, in all these complexes, the coordination number is 6. Now if I'm saying that the coordination number is 6, definitely all these are octahedral complexes. And because all these are octahedral complexes, they could have the hybridization as D2SP3 or SP3D2, right? Clear? Now, if it is D2SP3, we can say that it is inner orbital complex. Okay? And SP3D2, which uses 4D orbital or outer D orbital, we put this as outer orbital complex. Right? So when we actually, you know, do the working for these complexes, you will realize that Fe Cn6 4 negative because of the strong field, very strong field ligand Cn negative, the electrons, inner d orbitals will be involved because of the pairing of the electrons, right? So it is going to be D2 sp3. So basically it is going to be inner orbital complex, right? 
so is the case with MnCN6 four negative. This is also going to show D2 sp3 hybridization. So both these show D2 sp3 hybridization, and that's the reason they are inner orbital complex. The question is, which is going to be the outer orbital complex, right? Here you are having CO NH36 three positive and Ni NH36 two positive, right? Now here, this particular complex, tetra uh, or rather hexa amine cobalt ion, it is also found to show D2 sp3 hybridization. That means it is going to be inner orbital complex, right? And finally, this is going to show sp3 d2 hybridization. You can work this out, you will realize that hybridization here is coming out to be sp3 d2. And because it is showing sp3 d2, it means it is outer d orbital which is involved in the hybridization. And hence, it is outer orbital complex and that is the reason, correct answer should be d, right. So all of you, I hope you all got a clear understanding of certain questions, certain concepts with respect to the P block elements, DNF block elements and coordination compounds. So that was all from my side. Thank you very much.